the Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard said, do not be a fool and call that the Christianity of the New Testament, which is not the Christianity of the New Testament. The that that he was referring to was Danish cultural Christianity in the 19th century. So Kierkegaard used to observe that every Sunday his family and his friends would get dressed into their Sunday clothes and go to church where they would sing a few songs, say a few amens and listen to a homily and then come home and proceed to live lives that were entirely unaffected by any of the things that they heard during church. He knew that for the most part what people called Christianity was little more than a cultural habit. And so he said, do not call that Christianity, which is not the Christianity of the New Testament. He argued that the Christianity of the New Testament was something to which a person could not logically or philosophically take a non-committal approach. Either Christianity was or was not true. And if it was true, he argued, one should allow that truth to entirely permeate every single area of one's life. And so he said, I should actually be committed to this belief, not just in church, but in my place of work as well, and in my relationships, and in my and in my home, and in, and, in, and in my basement, and in my places of leisure. I want my Christianity to inform every single detail of my life and change the person that I am entirely. But, regarding that Christian Christianity, that total religion, the Bible has sobering things to say. Uh, at the moment, we're working our way through the Gospel according to St. Mark, verse by verse. And at the end of last week's scripture, we came to a hitherto henceforth moment in the story. Hitherto in Mark's story, the work of Jesus was done almost exclusively by Jesus. So it was Jesus who did the Bible teaching. It was Jesus who did the helping, the encouraging, the counseling. It was all about Jesus and what he did. Henceforth, however, the work of Jesus begins to be done more exclusively by the followers of Jesus, the disciples. So from this point in the story, it's them who do the Bible teaching and the helping and the healing and the encouraging. So last week, at the end of our study, we learned that Jesus sent his followers out. And we read this. They went out and they preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons. They anointed many sick people with oil. And they healed them. So that's kind and nice. This is a great moment in the lives of the disciples. They've been with Jesus for six chapters of the story. And now here we are in chapter six and a half. And they're doing it. No training wheels. And so, and, and so you would expect that verse 12. Which says the disciples went out and did that thing. Would immediately be followed by verse 30. Which says the apostles gathered round Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. One, logically, should immediately follow after the other. That would make sense. <clears throat> but that's not how the story goes. In between these two verses, which are about the followers of Jesus doing the work of Jesus, Mark inserts a seemingly unrelated story about the martyrdom of John the Baptist. This begs the question, why? Why in the middle of a story about Christian people doing Christian things should Mark choose to insert another story about a man getting his head cut off? The answer to this question is unsettling. Mark wants us, it seems, to understand the wider story, which is about being Christian, by first taking into account the mini-story about a man who loses his life. It seems that he wants us to understand that sometimes 
good people in the pursuit of a good life must reckon upon the unfair fate of John, a good man. That fate is introduced to us in verse 14 with a simple statement. King Herod heard about this, that is, he'd heard that Jesus sent his followers into Galilee to do their thing. And the reason that he heard about it was because people in those villages, superstitious as they were, were seeing that John the Baptist had been raised from the dead. Now, the reason that John was dead was because earlier in his career, he'd taken some ill-advised pot shots at some rather sensitive political figures. Um, just to bring you up to speed on the background, uh, King Herod, whom you know from the Christmas story, had, had a bunch of sons, most of whom were called Herod as well. So there was Herod Archelaus, Herod Philip, uh, Herod Antipas, Herod the Not-So-Great, Herod the Small, Herod with the Flaky Skin. I'm only making a few of those up. And a bunch of the women in the family were called Herod as well. There was Herodina, Her uh, 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 you know, so basically everyone around the dinner table had the same name, slightly strange. Anyway, so one of Herod the Great's sons, Herod Philip, married his niece Herodias, whose father Herod Archelaus had been murdered, murdered by her grandfather. Try to keep up. <laughs> and for a few years Herodias was happily married to her uncle husband. But then Herodias' uncle husband went on a business trip to Rome, and while he was out of town, she started to have an affair with her uncle husband's brother, who was also her uncle. So she divorces uncle husband number one, and gets married to her uncle husband's brother, who then becomes her uncle husband number two. Now this is so strange, it's funny, I think. And John the Baptist, it seems, was one of those preachers who just would not let it go. He, he, he seems to have had almost no filter. If a thought was in his head, it very quickly was a word on his lips. And unfortunately for him, he was wildly successful. Far more successful than Jesus, actually. From all over Israel, tens of thousands of people would, would travel for days in some cases to take in the, 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 the sermons of John the Baptist. And sometimes in these sermons, either to make a point, or perhaps as a joke to warm his audience up, he would mention the crazy, incestuous, weird goings-on in Herod's family. And everyone thought it was funny. Even the king, apparently, thought it was funny. And why wouldn't he? Why would he care anyway? He's a king who married his niece, whose father was murdered by his father, who used to be married to her brother. He doesn't care what anyone thinks of him. He's just doing his thing. But Herodias, according to history, was a deeply sensitive woman who couldn't bear the thought of people laughing at her. Couldn't bear the thought of people using the sorts of words that they would inevitably use to describe a woman who had the sorts of relationships that she had had. She lives in a deeply religious time, and hers is a deeply religious kingdom. She's troubled by, by, by the negative humor and the negative associations that people are attaching to her. And so for a puritanical preacher like John the Baptist, to be calling her out on her life is intolerable. So she nags and nags and nags uncle husband number two to have John thrown in prison. And so we read... Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, had him bound and put in prison. He did this, not because he wanted to, but because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he married. Now, the gossip from the ancient world is that Herodias was a real piece of work. Um, and, you know, in fairness to her, I suppose when your father is murdered by your grandfather that's going to have a psychological impact on you and it's either going to wreck you or toughen you Herodias it seems became very tough however she became tough in an unattractive way 
Um, for example, listen to what the first century historian Josephus says of her. Um, she goes, the, the sentence takes place when her first husband is out of town on business. Uh, she's at a party with her husband's brother, who's also her uncle. And I don't know. They exchange glances across a crowded room. And he's like, no, I don't think so. You're my brother's wife. I mean, I'm not going there. But, but she won't let it go. Look at how Josephus describes the woman. She never flagged till she carried the day and made Antipas her unwilling partisan. He didn't want to marry her. His brother's wife. His niece. There was no way of escape once she cast her vote on the matter. She's the sort of woman, it seems, who it's really hard to say no to. So according to this historian, she becomes infatuated with her husband's brother and just nags him and nags him and nags him to have an affair and get married until he finally says, fine, I'll marry you just to shut you up. <laughs> it's probably not a good reason to get married, I don't think. Probably not good to give someone an engagement ring just to keep them quiet. I don't know. He feels it's creepy, he feels it's inappropriate, but she wouldn't take no for an answer. Look at the line the historian uses. There was no way of escape once she cast her vote on the matter. Do you like this woman? Do you find her attractive as a human being? You're not meant to. However, before Herod Antipas marries his niece Herodias, he first has to get rid of his own wife. And this is controversial because at the time Herod Antipas is involved in a rather difficult border dispute with the king of Nabatea, and his first wife happens to be the king of Nabatea's daughter. This is awkward. So in Herod's kingdom, the average guy on the street is very uneasy about this incestuous marriage. It's all anyone is talking about, not because of the morality of it. I don't think then as now people particularly care what consenting adults do in the privacy of their own homes. What bothers them is that they think this relationship is going to offend the king of Nabatea, whose army are sharpening their swords just across the border. These people are convinced that Herod's dangerous new wife is going to bring them to war. And as is always the case in history, when that happens, it won't be the rich and powerful in their palaces that suffer. It will be the poor. The sort of people who are showing up week by week to listen to John the Baptist. And into that politically volatile situation that everyone is talking about in the first century... John has the temerity to stand up and say, I'm sorry, this is wrong. This ought not to happen. And here, stepping outside of the story for a moment and into our lives, we see something of the cost of total Christianity. When seen from a certain point of view, our religion often requires very little of us, does it? All we have to do is attend church, sing a few songs, say a few amens, listen to a sermon, don't spill coffee on the leather, and that's about it. But doing what is right in general, and following Jesus in particular, is more complex than that. It is who we are. Inside and out. Whether we are doing a deal in the boardroom, ironing laundry in the bedroom or watching television in the basement. It is who we are. And we live our faith not just in church but in all of life. And sometimes that requires us to do what John does here and stand up and say I'm sorry. I don't care how persuasive this is or what the group think is at the moment in my culture, or what way the wind happens to be blowing on this particular issue. I'm sorry, this is wrong. And I have the guts to say so. So this deal everyone else in the boardroom is asking me to do, I won't do it. It's wrong. 
These things you're asking me to watch on television, I'm sorry, I won't watch them, it's wrong. This conversation everyone else is comfortable having, I'm sorry, I won't be having it, it is wrong. And I have the courage of conviction to say so. Following Jesus, biblically understood, requires us to live each moment of this complex life as we best believe Jesus would have us live it. And that is hard. Because you can't hang it up on a Sunday afternoon and pick it up again six days later. Now, the lie we tell you, not just in church, but I think in culture generally, the lie we tell you is that if you do the right thing, It'll all work out. We tell you to be good because good things happen to good people. And yet here's John in prison, a reminder that sometimes bad things happen to good people. I mean, let's get this right, yeah? John is a good man. As far as we know, he never did a wrong thing his whole life. In Matthew's version of this story, Jesus actually says of John, he, you won't find a finer man than this. I mean, how would you like that on your resume? The Son of God thinks I'm awesome. Did no wrong ever. Always tried to do the next right thing in life. Committed to decency and morality and his faith. Absolutely. And the reward for his goodness is he gets nothing but trouble. How many times have you experienced your best intentions being mocked by the cold and cruel realities of fate? How many times did you play fair and play by the rules only to discover too late that others were playing by different rules? Sometimes it doesn't matter how well you play and how good you are. It still blows up in your face anyway. And as you persist in your right desire to be good and do good, this is something that Mark would have you reckon upon in your faith. Sometimes doing good and being good doesn't work out. Sometimes it blows up in your face anyway. But we do it anyway. We would not do good to get good consequences. We would do good because good is right. And we desire to be right. Regardless of cost. Next sentence. While this good man is in prison, Herodias, that formidable, nagging woman whom I, I'm encouraging you to hate, nursed a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. My goodness, woman, when will you be happy? Like, is it not enough for you that you've brought down a good man? Is it not enough for you that you've ruined his career and, and, and put him in prison? Is that not enough for you? It seems not. Next sentence. Finally, the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials, his military commanders, and the leading men of Galilee. Again, please notice how unfair this is. The only good person in this story is downstairs chained in the dungeon. Everyone else is upstairs having the time of their life. Ever been there? You did nothing wrong, nothing, but you were made to suffer anyway. And while the people who did that to you, they happily got on with their lives. And while they turned the knife and put you through what they put you through, not an ounce of your goodness mattered, not an ounce of your decency counted. Next sentence. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod 
and his dinner guests question, what do you think the word pleased means in that sentence? So according to ancient records, this woman is uh, uh, um, uh, Salome. Uh, we think, and we're probably right to think, that she is the child of Herodias's first marriage to uncle husband number one, whom she divorced in favour of uncle husband number two. And the text says, notice quite innocently, that she came in and she danced and the men were pleased. She came in, she danced and the men were pleased. This is the ancient world. And in the ancient world, dancing of this sort in this context is, is almost exclusively erotic. The closest thing that we would have in our culture to this would be lap dancing or pole dancing of the sort you would discover in one of those gentlemen's clubs in the GTA. And so obviously in the ancient world no daughter of a royal house like Salome, the great granddaughter of Herod the Greek no less, no woman of this family and of this position would allure herself to dance for the pleasure of men. That was something that dancing girls did. And I've never done a study of it of course, but I would imagine that if you did a demographic analysis of the girls who work in Toronto strip bars, you'd probably discover that not too many of them are the daughters of senators or members of parliament. In fact, I imagine that quite the reverse would be true. I imagine that most of them would be from the bottom of the economic scale, just getting by, doing whatever they have to do, forced by economic necessity to, 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 to do what they do. Actually, I, 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 I suppose I have done a study of it, actually. Um, years ago, I used to work with prostitutes in Glasgow. Um, so on, on, on a Friday and Saturday night, we, we, we would rent a cafe in the red light district in, in Glasgow, and we would get cakes from the baker at um, the end of the day. And... Uh, it never crossed my mind that we were giving tarts to tarts, but um, <laughs> probably should have. Anyway, um, so uh, you know, it, it was a very beautiful thing. So we would have uh, tea and cakes and sandwiches, and a female doctor was there, and and the girls would come in, and you know, for a tea break or whatever, and it was a it was a warm, safe place where they could take a break from their cold, dangerous lives. And so I think I can tell you with some authority, actually, that not a single person in this industry lives the dream. Not a single person in this industry is doing what they are doing because that's what they dreamed of doing as a young person. They are doing it because they are desperate at the very bottom, harsh lives. Salome is not one of these. And the men around Herod's table rich and powerful as they are in a pre-Harvey Weinstein world used to getting whatever they want whenever they want they've seen dancing girls before they know what a dancing girl is it's a way of life in the Orient it still is but what they've never seen is the daughter of a royal house dance not because she has to but because she wants to and because it is so taboo and so forbidden it is all the more erotic to them and it drives them wild so wild that in a moment of boisterous conviviality we read that the king said to the girl now let's get this straight yeah this girl who's just driven him and everyone else in the room wild is his wife's brother's daughter his great niece and he likes it and so he says ask me anything you want and i'll give it to you up to half my kingdom payday a word i like in that sentence anything anything I've got a pretty big imagination, and if someone offers me anything, I'm going to take everything. It's brilliant. So the girl goes out, and she says to her mother, 
Uh, she has to go out because her mother won't be in the room. This is a male-only party. Um, and she says to her mother, now what shall I ask for? So it seems that Salome is, is still very much a girl uh, in this story and um, still very much under the control of her manipulative, controlling mother. So she goes into the, into the next room where, 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 where the mother is watching her daughter dance for, for men I know. It says, what shall I ask for? Your husband, my uncle, says I can have anything I want. What shall I ask for? Now, she's a teenager. I'm thinking a car, a pony, and some Tide Pods for supper, right? Her mother then says to her stripper daughter, I want you to ask for the head of John the Baptist. I wasn't expecting that. But what fascinates me about this is that this perverse request does not, does not only freak out Salome. She seems to get a kick out of it. There is a fetal sexual perversity here that we're meant to despise. The next sentence, verse 25, then is masterfully done in Greek. The object of desire, not in English, but in Greek, is, is, is reserved for the very end of the sentence. So the girl who's just done this dance for these men walks up, we are to imagine, somewhat playfully, and says to the king, I want you to bring me right now on a platter the head of John the Baptist. Ouch. What kind of sicko pervert gets a kick out of performing this sort of dance for her uncle and then afterwards asks him to commit murder? And so we read sadly that immediately we are to think against his better judgment. The king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head and so the story ends. Another good man goes down. John dies. The only good person in this story. The only person who ever tried to do right in his life. Is murdered as a finale to a twisted dance. At a weird family party. And this is the story that Mark would have the church reckon with as they consider pursuing goodness in life and decency and morality in their Christian faith. Sometimes the wheels come off. Sometimes it breaks. Sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes your best efforts are mocked by the ignominious realities of this filthy, beautiful life in which we live. That's just how it is sometimes. And I like what Bono says about this. I don't like Bono generally. I think he goes on a bit. But No? Okay. Um, Bono said famously that Christianity isn't karma. And I like that. Because I think the big idea in religion and in, and in culture and in life is that, is that karma kind of makes sense. You know, you get what you deserve. You do good, good stuff will happen. You do bad, you'll get what you deserve as well. An eye for an eye, you reap what you sow. <coughs> the cold logic of karma is irrefutable. Be good, good things will happen. And then Jesus comes along and he, he spoils that simple logic with an idea the New Testament calls grace. And grace defies the cold logic of karma. In the New Testament, the love of God interrupts consequences. It interrupts this notion that we always get what we deserve. And that appeals to me. Because I, like you... I'm not entirely sure I always deserve what's good. I mean, if karma's your judge, you're in trouble. 
Karma has very high expectations of how you will live your life, and it will not excuse your mistakes. But if grace is your judge, then it's not about you getting what you deserve and you reaping what you sow. It's about Jesus taking your sins to the cross and paying for your mistakes on your behalf. Maybe then, in our religion, rather than naively wishing for life to be fair and for us to get what we think we deserve, we should instead accept the fact that we are accepted the way we are. Accept the fact that the love of God shown to you on the cross through Christ has interrupted forever the consequences of your behaviour such as it is. And that that God then wants to bless you in life and not berate you. And I think that matters. Because once you accept that you are accepted the way that you are, you can then begin to accept others the way that they are. And release yourself from the constant pressure of trying to make life fairer for you. I'm no shrink, but I think that people who, who, who are screwed up in life tend to screw others up in turn. I think that the bitter, angry, twisted people we meet every day are people who have never found the grace of a God who is kind and forgiving and patient with them. What do you think God expects of you in life, seriously? What do you think God expects of you this week? Morality? Perfection? Decency? A better religious observance? An impeccable goodness? That you should pull your socks up and try much harder than you hitherto have been? And does living under that pressure make you a better human being? In my experience it does not. Maybe if the Christianity of the New Testament is correct, God expects nothing of you but offers to you everything. Maybe rather than saying today I must be perfect and moral and religious and try harder, it would be better to say today I am accepted and forgiven and loved. And in the service of a God who is endlessly and infinitely patient, merciful. Today the judge of my soul has said that I am right with him. And always shall be. Maybe better to live in a position of who God says you already are rather than trying to live according to who you think you should be. But never quite manage to be. And for some reason this story was written to the church. A man didn't get what he deserved. It didn't work. And Jesus wasn't there. Jesus didn't help. A good man had a train wreck. And Jesus didn't help. And I think this is written to the church, post-resurrection as it is, to say to the church, don't just trust your feelings on these issues when the wheels come off. Trust the Christian facts. Remember the final chapters of the story. The tomb is still empty. Jesus is still alive. And he is absolutely with you, even though it feels that he is absolutely not. And so you persist in goodness, not because it leads to good consequences, but because it is the good thing to do. He is with you. And so we would comfort ourselves with words from the Old Testament that perhaps John comforted himself with in his final ignominious moments. Do not be afraid. I am with you. Do not be disheartened. I am your God. And I will strengthen you. 
and I will help you. Promise. We're past time. Let's pray before we go. <coughs> Our Father, sometimes we don't, we just don't know how to pray. Our, our lives are too broken for our prayers to be polished. Our, our faith is too fragile for our voice to sound certain. And so imperfect as we are, we say to you that we do believe and that we wish to believe. We ask that our faith would be full this week and unreserved. We ask that our lives will be filled with an unexpected joy and a sudden peace and a deep gladness. We ask that our Christian believing will make us better people, not worse. And we will not have the cheek to ask you to walk with us for we know that you already do. Thank you then. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.